Yes, yes, yes. Welcome back. Welcome back to another episode of Act Root to Fruit. My name is Marcel Tassara, and I'm on a quest to dig into the roots of the contextual behavioral sciences so that the fruit that us clinicians deliver is as pristine as possible. And uh, so I've, I've got some guides along the way, and today I'm, I'm really grateful to be joined by the Mr. Dr. DJ Moran. Thanks for, thanks for joining me. Happy yeah. to be here, Marcel. Thanks for the uh, invitation. I'm glad to be talking to you about this yeah, stuff. Pre- yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I appreciate it. Uh, um, a few things I want to say about DJ, just to, to let anybody who, who's not familiar with him um, in the loop, is uh, he's lucky enough to be a Marquette alumni. Yeah. Like myself. <laughs> <laughs> Although you only got your bachelor's there, so we're not That's really right. at the same level. You know. Right, right. Um, and, and, and I think you probably had a different mascot there when I, when, then when, yeah. When I, oh yeah. A lot has changed since then. Yeah. A lot has changed for, for, for pro- a lot of progress. Right. That's true. Good. That's right. Um, so anyways, in, on all seriousness, know that, uh, Dr. DJ Moran is, uh, past president of the association for contextual behavioral sciences, a, a fellow in ACBS. Um, apparently you're pretty good at mentoring. You got the outstanding mentor award from the behavioral analysis international. And that, that speaks volumes for, for your, your um, giving back. And, you know, you being here today, I appreciate that. You're co-author of Act and Practice with Patty Bach. And um, I want to mention that uh, my first episode with, um, with Joanne Steinwalks, that was one of the books that she mentioned in terms of really um, learning about um, clinical behavior analysis. Right. Is that, right. Is that right. a good way of, is that a good way to sum up the book? I, I would say so. And I really appreciate Joanne. Uh, and all she's done in the ACT community. That was a really yeah. cool interview. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also committed action in practice. And you've appeared on the Learning Channel, Animal Planet, the Oprah Winfrey Network, um, discussing anxiety disorders and hoarding. And uh, for all those who, who didn't know, um, DJ is now a, a professor at Long Island University in Long Island. No longer, he's no longer in the middle of America. That's it's right. Edge. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, um, currently also CEO of Institute for Higher Performance, an organization that does uh, psych assessment over telehealth. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Roger that. So you're busy, yeah. you're a busy guy. Yeah. Marcel, and you left out the most important thing from an introduction. I actually am the father of Loudon and Harmony Moran. That's, that's ah. the most important title that I yeah, have. Right. The other stuff I could throw away. Thank you With for you. the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Um, speaking of which, you know, that's, there's a, that's a, it's a lot of, a lot of stuff that you've, um, you've done and, and it, I, I sense that it's been a labor of love, but so we could get to know you a little bit more. If you could, if you could be in any band current or past, what band would it be? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, it's funny that you're asking that cause you know, I'm staring at, um, the, the, CDs and the cassettes that I recorded with my friends. I, I mean, I'd rather be in yeah. my old band Sonopath hanging out okay. with the people that I love and I still, uh, I still admire. And I, I just love to do that again. So I don't want to join someone else's band. All right. All right. Yeah. I want, I want to get my band back together. You know, that, that, that's the band I would like to be a part of. Uh, the one that, that I was together with back in the nineties for like a decade. They're, they're like my brothers. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's mm-hmm. awesome. I want I, I, I want to live, I want my life. And I, I think my, for the most part of my life is like that to, to be just really grateful for my experiences. And, and yeah. uh, I, I appreciate yeah, you saying that. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. Happy to do it. But if I had another choice, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to uh, be the singer for Black Sabbath because okay. they were doing all that stuff before I was born and mm-hmm. they're still doing it now. So to have that kind of longevity to yeah, be able yeah, to yeah. do something for 50 years, that sounds like a, a pretty good, uh, good good opportunity too. Okay. With yeah. that eating and all? Yeah, right. Yeah. With, I mean, with all the problems that came along with that kind of career, maybe yeah. I'm glad I sidestepped the rock and roll <laughs> lifestyle and became a dad and, and yeah. a professor and a psychologist. Are, are, if, if someone went on YouTube, could they listen to your, your uh, 90s? Uh, I think we have one 
song out there and I told myself I was going to put everything and I was going to write a video of my favorite song and do all this. But it turns out that, you know, there's only 24 hours in a day. So okay. one all of these right, things I'll right. get into. But, but yeah, we're called Sonopath. And I think we have one song up there. Okay. Sonopath. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to find it. I'm going to find yeah, that. Cool. Cool. Uh, so you are a, a man known for interesting t-shirts. And I would love to start this conversation around your fuck mentalism t-shirt. Right. All right. What is that think, about? Yeah. So one of the folks who I learned a lot from in graduate school was Dick Malott. In okay. fact, he took a chance on me. I once wrote him, and it's funny you're asking me this. I once wrote him during my first year as an academic. And I said, Dick, you know, I really admire all that you do. And I've got a good idea. I want to I want to write all these different educators and behavior analysis and have them talk about different aspects of, of evidence-based educational methods, uh, direct instruction, standard acceleration, charting, precision teaching. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I have no juice, but you got tons. So how about we pair up and we'll edit a book together called Evidence-Based Education Methods. And it's funny that you're asking me about uh, about the uh -huh. um, the T-shirt right now because the book's right here. Yeah. Um, so we, we wrote this book together, okay? So getting back to the T-shirt, Dick Malott, lots of juice in the behavior analysis community, right? He's at Western Michigan University. He uh -huh. used to sell T-shirts as a fundraiser for his graduate students, and it okay. had a mouse who was pulling a lever. It was a cartoon mouse pulling a lever, and the cheese falls in, in his hands, and the the, the bubble over the rat or the mouse's head just says, fuck mentalism. Uh -huh. And what that means is this rat is able to engage in behaviors and see things like stimuli in the world that are antecedents or just like signals uh -huh. in the world. Like now's an opportunity to act and then he can engage in the behavior and, and then he gets the cheese or he gets the reinforcer or the consequence. He doesn't have to think about it. Ah. So uh, an organism can learn by interacting with the environment to engage in successful behavior. You don't have to have like a schema. You don't have to have the id and the ego pushing you to do this kind of stuff. It's just that your interaction with the environment helps you have a conditioning history to continue to do successful actions. So the rat saying fuck mentalism is basically saying you can be successful in trying to get consequences and speaking very lightly without uh -huh. having to think about it. It's, it's how we interact with the environment that has the most impact on our repertoires, not necessarily what we're thinking about. That's okay. what we mean by like a mentalism, like that, there's a dualistic approach to human life that that there's there's our behavior and then there's our thinking and the thinking is different um i i don't as a behavior analyst really want to think of or perceive thoughts as if they were causal i don't want to imagine that there's an id or an ego or a schema or rational cognitions that make me do things that's very mentalistic Okay. I want to look at thinking as another behavior. It just happens to be a private one. Right? It, mm. Thinking, using language privately is a behavior. It's not separate from behavior. Mentalists okay. think that, that it is separate. And well, fuck mentalism. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so uh, there's a lot of questions I have with that. Uh, and I'll start with how important is it for someone who's a th considering themselves a, a third waiver to, to, to buy what you just said? It's a, it's a good question. It all depends on what your goals are. Um, what are you aiming to do while you're this third waiver? If you're aiming to be a third mm -hmm. waiver, I mean, if you're going to publish in peer reviewed journals and, and teach and become an act recognized trainer and get tenure, you really, you, you need to get it. You, you mm -hmm. have to get a better sense of radical behaviorism or functional contextualism, understand contextual behavioral science. 
immerse yourself in relational frame theory if, if that's the pursuit as a third waiver. But I really want to be welcoming to people who want to be third waivers insofar as being act practitioners. Okay. And say, listen, I guess you don't need to. I mean, okay. care, care about lifelong learning and continuous education. And I hope you will embrace learning more about the basic science. And I don't want to make that a benchmark, a hurdle, like that you have to understand what an arbitrarily applicable derived relational response is yeah. in order to start doing acceptance and commitment therapy. That's too dangerous because acceptance commitment therapy is an evidence-based approach. There are 350 randomized controlled trials saying that the application is worthy and moves dependent measures on clinical and subclinical concerns. So I don't, I, I want people to say, oh, I want to learn more about that. I want to learn yeah. how to, you know, help people become more psychologically flexible with these evidence-based approaches. And then if we put up this block, like, well, first, you really need to understand mutual and combinatorial entailment. Uh -huh. They're like, I'm out. And <laughs> I, I don't want anybody to say I'm out. I, I want yeah. them to, to get into it and then leave them along. And, and like, this is how you get into like act a little bit more advanced. So okay. I, I, I don't want, I don't want to ever stop anybody from wanting to be a third waiver okay. by saying there's some kind of benchmark that needs to be met first. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I appreciate that because, and like I've, I've shared in previous discussions, my, my introduction to behaviorism was, is, was of the kind of rigid or a variety. And I, and I really appreciate, you know, hearing yeah. Yeah. someone like you of your ilk say what you just said. You know, Marcel, it, it's kind of like this and I appreciate what you just said, but I can teach all of my graduate student therapists really quickly how to do flooding mm -hmm. and exposure techniques and give them a treatment plan and say, all right, this is how we do it. You know, this, th these are the clinically relevant concerns and this is the anxiety uh, issue. And these are the measures we're going to use. And this is the intervention. This is flooding. This is exposure. And they can learn the techniques. Yeah. And never learn about Maurer's two-factor theory and classical conditioning and operant conditioning. They don't have to. I can teach them the techniques on how to do this stuff. But man, I really hope they learn that classical and operant conditioning stuff and, and the link between those two. Because I think understanding unconditioned stimuli and conditioned stimuli and discriminative stimuli, mm -hmm. that helps the case conceptualization when things become complex or unique. And it would be good to have that foundation or that framework on how is this flooding and this exposure therapy working? Like what, what, what are the, the frameworks that make it happen? So yeah. I always think it's a good idea to go beyond just learning technique. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's, and that's, uh, that's why we're here. Yeah. I mean, that's, that. that's why, you know, if we're going to talk about act as a technique, yeah. I'm going to say, all right, now you've learned it let's understand relational frame theory stuff, mm -hmm. right? This is flooding. Mm -hmm. This is exposure. This is classical conditioning. And this is operant conditioning. This is acceptance commitment therapy and the hexagon model, which normally gets taught first. And, and this is how language works and why it leads to psychological inflexibility and what we can do about that. And, and taking that next step, I think helps you become a more advanced act therapist, just like okay. understanding classical conditioning and operant conditioning will help you become a more advanced exposure therapist. Mm -hmm. Okay. When we, when we talked, um, earlier, you talked about one of the, the, the major stumbling blocks is embodying this work. That's, that's, that's what's, what gets people kind of, I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned just having, I mean, you're, you're what, uh, 26 years into your, your trudge here. Yeah. And you said, you said just recently, it's like, you've had some realizations, right? That are. Yeah. Been... Yeah. Marcel, I, uh, I met Robin and Steve at an ABBA conference in 1994. Not and, the Swedish uh, rock band, right? <laughs> right. Association for behavior analysis, uh, in the Atlanta, in Atlanta, it was my first time ever going to it and just blew my mind. And I said, that's it. 
this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this acceptance and commitment therapy stuff. And uh, I haven't looked mm-hmm. back. But I have to say that it took a while for even Steve to publish something big on it. I used to, mm-hmm. you know, be, this is before like real email. I used to write them handwritten letters saying like, hey, bro, when are you going to actually write a full uh-huh. on treatment manual book, you know? Uh, and it finally came out in 1999. And, and, and still, like, it really wasn't accepted for a long time period of time and people were thinking that we were part of a cult and it was wishy-washy and here it is in 2020 it's really taken root and people are understanding it a little bit more so i'm really glad that i was fortunate enough to hook my you know my cart on this act wagon a long time ago but i have to say that it's mostly been a scientific academic exercise for me because Mm. i'm very, very lucky person. I mean, it's one thing for all of the privileges that I have, but it's just mm-hmm. also just a good fortune that I had that I, I never really had to put it to work. Like it helped me get over my pre keynote speech jitters, you know, I see, it, helped I me, see. it helped me, you know, deal with when my daughter is playing soccer and then, you know, the other team's dad is yelling at her and I'm doing like acceptance and commitment to being a peaceable person, but we're talking about like really minor things, you know, and it helps me because I don't have a clinically relevant issue. And then last three years, I mean, 2017 had one of the most traumatic, no, the most traumatic event I've ever had that I really understood full on balls out, complete Mm -hmm. suffering, Mm -hmm. 10 on a 10 scale, subjective units of distress. It was horrible. Yeah. Um, I, I think about it every day and it's three years ago. Uh, 2018 was, was just rough. I mean, it was just, it was the roughest year of my life. My heart was breaking every single day. 2019, my kids go to college and I'm an empty nester. My significant other of 30 years finishes a divorce with me. I move across the country. I get a brand new job, sell the old, you know, businesses, I no longer what I was for a really long period of time, except I am that same person, that core self, that selfless context that we talk about and acceptance commitment therapy. That was the anchor, man. That was like, yeah. that was it. Having that, that tether line to a core self was just so amazing. And I'm thankful to have those 20 years of ACT training to be able to apply to my own stuff uh-huh. because it was rough. And looking back on the last three years, I am so grateful for every single drop of pain and suffering that I had. I'm happier now. I'm more values-based. I feel like I'm at a meaningful place. And it's yeah. because of the pain it's because of it fucking and, pain man yeah, yeah i mean <laughs> yeah i mean so yeah. so yeah the so that's why you know when you mentioned a little bit earlier like that people need to embody this stuff it's one thing to be able to fluently talk about you know the definitions of mm-hmm. the components of the hexagon pass the test yeah right and and i i i ace that stuff you know i'm just mm-hmm really very fluid in talking about acts. So Mm -hmm. it sounds like I know what I'm talking about. And I do because I've read a lot. I've been to a lot of workshops, but it wasn't until life went, oh yeah, you think you know this stuff? Mm -hmm. Try this out and then actually applying it. And so I'm, I'm encouraging people to be more experiential in my trainings now. And I think that's always been the party line in the ACT community. The recognized ACT trainer group really pushes the idea of experiential learning. And yeah. I just, I, I just, I just can't promote that enough. I think okay. that you have to embody this stuff. You have to, you have to practice it, you know, because in reality, in your career, in your relationships, in, in everything that you do, you're only going to do it for a finite period of time. And the question is, are you living your life because of your values? Or are you living your life 
in the direction that you were trained in order to be a good boy or a good girl? Like, are you just mm -hmm. doing what you were told? Did you learn language to just really fit into your subculture? And that mm -hmm. sets you up to do certain behaviors that you were reinforced to do? Or do you take the opportunity to just go, I don't know if what I'm doing is really meaningful and vital to me. And I'm going to call shenanigans on everything. Yeah. And then pick, pick it apart and say, what do I truly really want my life to be about? And don't look at that as just like this academic exercise or something you do because you went to an act workshop, but really make that choice today. Contact the yeah. present moment, be in the here and now and say, mm -hmm. is, this is my life right now. The Buddha said, how long is a breath? And people guessed 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. He said, no, the length of life is but one breath. It's now. Your life is now. What are you doing with it? Yeah. And, and, and how much yeah, have you been it. conditioned to do? Uh -huh. Yeah, question everything. Yeah. Uh, if, if you were to meet someone, if you were to, you know, let's do this. Let's do the go back and talk to your previous self activity here real quick. If you, DJ Moran of today, got approached by DJ Moran of uh, 15 years ago, and he said, I'm kind of feeling this, but I, I, I want to feel it more. And I, and cause, cause there's people who are listening and they're definitely, they're, they're past DJ. They're not current DJ. So what do you, what do you tell this, this past DJ? I don't know. That's a good question because I think the teacher couldn't be sought out. The, the, the random pain had to happen. Okay. Like, you know, if I, I, I don't think I would have been able to tell my, my, um, you know, 35 year old self, like seek out this horrible traumatic event in your life and have that <laughs> happen now. I'd be like, no, I'm not going to do that. Everything's working out pretty sweet right now. Um, I think I might have influenced him to meditate more and, okay. um, be more vulnerable. Mm. Uh, with relationships. Yeah. I think I am very blessed to be a um, six foot three, highly verbal white guy who uh -huh. had the opportunity to be raised in a blue collar situation. So I am pretty tough, but I also got a PhD. So I have the best of both worlds and kind of have the world uh, like, like, like it's my oyster, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I'm try to pay it forward, try to share as much as I can, try mm -hmm. to check my privilege as much as I can. And I, I, I just at this point would say to a 35 year old, let yourself be more vulnerable because you don't know just how much power you have and how much you could share with other uh -huh. people. So Love I it. think, I think I would have been stronger and grown better had I yeah. been more willing to be weaker than continue to show my strength. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, the conditioning is as as a fellow white male uh, is that we don't show weakness and we don't ask for help. Right. right. Yeah, totally. And, uh, no, absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. And and I find for myself, I just want to chime in that, you know, I, I can concur with your experience of, of uh, learning a lot in pain. And yeah. uh, and it takes I, I need a lot of help, though, to be able to see the nuggets of gold in the pain, you know, because otherwise they given like just my own mind will just say it's it's it was it was you know i just kind of blame everyone else and I'm, my situation needs to change and i'm just going to get it right next time you know right yeah 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 that's probably where the mindfulness stuff comes in right you know just to be more aware open uh present mm -hmm. with these kinds of opportunities when the stimulus cues show up you know, yeah. now's the time for action. What do you really care about in your life? You keep saying that to yourself privately, verbally, but like, boom, now, now are the stimulus events. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, if you really did learn from the past and you really are going to walk the talk, well, here, here you go. Here it is. Contact this present moment. I know you're scared. Can you accept it? I know you're talking yourself out of it. Can you diffuse from that? I know you tell yourself, 
oh, I don't have to put up with this stuff. I've got tons of privilege. Can you also just get back to the self as context that you're just a human being? And can you get in touch with those values and say, I, I want to be a more vulnerable person. I want to uh, connect with people a little bit better, even if it's painful. And I'm going to commit to doing those behaviors right here and right now. And I just walked around the hexagon right there. Yeah. Um, but I, I think I think that was missing uh, 35 years. I mean, when I was a 35 year old, like I think yeah. knowing the hexagon was one thing, applying it to my own stuff was different. And I just, yeah. I just didn't have the perspective. And, and I wouldn't be surprised, DJ, if, if you and I sit down in, in 26 years and, and you say, well, 26 years ago, I really, I really didn't have it. It wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> sunk in right? like it is now. Right. I mean, isn't that kind of maybe, you know? right. Maybe. I mean, beginner's mind, right. Oh, we- yeah. Yeah. I mean, just always be looking like I didn't have it all together. At what point does anyone have it all together? You know, yeah. um, and, and, and look at I'm I'm talking to you, and I'm talking to you as if I'm with you on the 26 years. I'm not. I'm like you know a couple of years into my actually my first boot camp. That I mean, my first you know when I first drunk the Kool Aid, you were the first. You were it was 2016, and you were you did the Friday or Thursday? Was it was it the Thursday? Oh, yeah. in, in, oh, in snap. is that right? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh huh. Wow. 2000. So that was the, was that the time when I was given the lecture and my brother-in-law passed away during the workshop? I don't know. Did you mention it? In the- I think so. Maybe you were, maybe you took a bathroom break or went to go get the water or something. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, that wow. was uh, yeah, 2016. Yeah, it was the workshop when uh, we were working with, uh, I guess Steve was there. Steve Kelly and Robin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, that, yeah, my, yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, that was, uh, oh, yeah, that was an interesting time. So 2016, that's when you started getting yeah. an act, huh? Yeah. 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 Good deal. And, uh, yeah. So, so I'm looking forward to, you know, uh, 20, 22 years down the line to see <laughs> where I'm at. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. And no, I'm not, I'm, I'm happy to be where I am today. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful. So, cool. um, Okay, so so I I also heard you say that you read the article that Steve wrote, "Making Sense of Spirituality," every year. Does has yeah. that? As you still do? A are you still doing that? And if if yes, has has that shifted for you in the last few years? What's what yeah. what's in there? I I read it a lot. I don't I don't want to say that like I read it every birthday that I have. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I I read that article more than any other article. Okay, uh, over and over again. I just love it. I mean. Look, I mean, Steve's fantastic. I mean, he had more influence on me than probably anybody else um, in the way I think about psychology and about life, you know. And uh, I mean, that article is just, it's just so ballsy. It came out in 1984 in a journal called Behaviorism. Mm -hmm. And Skinner is still alive. Right. And Steve decides to write an article for a journal called Behaviorism. And the title is Making Sense of Spirituality. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like, holy cow, this is, I mean, it's just so ballsy, you know? And uh, I, I highly recommend people read it. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's easy to search out on Google, no problem. You get the PDF. And yeah. it, it really, can seem like it's an introduction to act because it, it is. He even wrote uh, to the listserv back in 2016 that that article was historical seed corn. I mean, gotta like it. We gotta love the, the terminology. It's historical seed corn for acceptance commitment therapy huh. and relational frame theory. And it really just unpacks not, not spirituality in like a dualistic way, but how did human beings start to come about with conversations about spirituality? And let's say, let's just say we assume that there is no such thing as mm-hmm. dualism or an afterlife or ghosts or God. If we're going to be scientific about it, how the heck do people come around to like talking about spirituality? It, it doesn't, Again, with the assumption of, you know, no dualism, it doesn't exist. How, how did it come around to this, you know? And it, it's like this. To, to get it, 
without me summarizing the article, but more experientially, to anyone listening to this, and to you too, Marcel, like, are you hearing something? Are you hearing something right now? And the answer is, I would imagine you would say yes. You know, all mammals hear. And so we're hearing something, but, but more than that, do you know that you are hearing? Can you perceive that you are hearing? It's not just that there are sounds out there and you're having the sensation of hearing, but can you also perceive that you are the one hearing? Can you do that, Marcel? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Can you also have the perspective that you are the one hearing? I'm the one hearing, yes. Yeah. Like you're hearing me right now, so that's one thing, mm -hmm. you're hearing. And then you can perceive that you, something about oh, you is hearing. Mm -hmm. And then you can even step back from that and say, I notice that I am one who hears. And then what I'm going to ask you to do, and I'm not going to go ad nauseum, uh, ad nauseum. Can you step back even from that and see that you are the one who notices that you are the one who is hearing? Can you keep taking a perspective and just simply notice that you do these behaviors? Here's mm -hmm. the catch. Can you perceive the context from which you are perceiving? And the answer, as far as I can understand, is no. Like, who is the one hearing? Well, well, I am. Can I perceive the I? From what perspective am I looking at me or the you or I? Where is that? Mm -hmm. And it's nowhere. And it's everywhere. And I'm not trying to be profound. Mm -hmm. There is a perspective from which you notice things that's formless. You can't find it. You can't see it. You can't measure it. You can't tell me where the corners of the edges are of that you. Mm -hmm. You hear, and you can even notice that you hear. But who's doing the noticing that you hear? Well, I am. All right, where's that I? Is it your brain? No, no, no. Is it your chemistry? No. Where is it? I don't know. It just got built up through language over a period of time. I have an eye that I can't perceive because if I try to perceive it from where am I going to perceive it from? So it's formless. I can't perceive it. It's immaterial. It's not a thing that you can hold. It's not your brain. It knows everything you know. So yeah. it's omniscient. It's everywhere you go. So it's omnipresent. And it's been around as long as you've been around, as long as you've been conscious. So it's eternal. If you want to break my chops about it, fine. It's not eternal. It hasn't been around forever. You had a birth date and then it's been around experientially forever. So it's sempaternal. So we're talking about something that's formless, immaterial, omniscient, omnipresent, and sempaternal. And it's something we experience all the time. Like it's part of our daily experience. And those are the things that we would call spiritual things mm -hmm. that are formless and omniscient and ever present and immaterial and sempaternal or eternal. There's something about trying to perceive something that isn't anything. So it's nothing, it's no thing, but it's everything. It's everything mm -hmm. to you. And I, I, if you check out that, that that article like and read more about it it's just like it just it just blows your mind um in yeah. it steve says and i think is a quote quite literally it may be that verbal behavior gave humankind a soul like that we huh. can articulate yeah i that we can with verbal behavior know things we get shaped up to have certain language, to know our own perspective and call it I. If you're in Spain, maybe you call it yo. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's arbitrary what we call it. But to be able to, to see that you see is such a human thing. And it's so language-based and it really has given us complexity to our lives and meaning. Um, I, I just think that article is just so fantastic. And, and uh, so for really, really 
capturing the the inner behavior for understanding what's happening inside. Right. With there this, you go. With this language, yeah. Okay. Right. Well, that I think that's a perfect segue into uh, what I had suggested earlier. We talk about for for some experiential work, and that's around this meditation piece. Cool. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. Man, right so, on. so what I'm thinking is, is I, I, I'm going to just start to talk, and and you can be my, um, you know, my um, consultant. Okay. And uh, and ask what we want to ask, and I mean, I guess the purpose is is just to kind of I want to I want to work out some things and talk about some things, but then maybe afterwards we could unpack it from and kind of look at it from a functional assessment kind of analysis point of view. What do you think? Right. Let's give it a shot. All right. So. Uh, I've been meditating on and off for, for um, a while, and this actually since this quarantine, it's been my best stretch that I've ever had. It's been it's been fabulous, and uh, uh, cons- of con- consistently meditating. And so I notice a lot of really kind of interesting things happening inside as I meditate. One of the things is is you know I'm I'm trying to focus on I'm trying to focus on something, and um, one of the things I've learned about meditation for me that works is that it's not about like not thinking it's about letting go of those of my thoughts good and uh and so um i actually i actually took some notes so i'm just going to be totally transparent here because i had i after i got up from the cushion today i, I took some notes on some things that were happening okay and so um i want to bring those to what we're doing here now so oh so so one of my goals is to really work on my relationship to my mind that's good. where i'm at right now is like how am i how am I uh, being led or not being led? How am I a puppy on the leash to this, to this beast that, you know, is up there that helps me a lot, but also is, you know, on, on too much of the time. And so I'm working on letting go. One of the things that I, I tend to do is, is I focus on sounds and I, I get like the experience of kind of light when I, I, I have, I can kind of like see some kind of spots and that that's something that draws my attention as well as almost the sound of like tinnitus, you know, like the kind of ringing, we, there's always kind of a white noise going on. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's very topical right now too, to our, uh, our, uh, what's going on in the United States. But so, uh, so, so that is something I pay attention to. And, and one of my concerns with that though, is that I'm someone I'm, I'm like in my head way too much and I want to be more, I want, I, I want to learn to be more in my, in my, below my neck. Okay. Okay. And paying attention to, you know, what's going on physically, emotionally. And so one of my concerns is if I'm paying attention to these kind of this experience up here, that I'm not that it's it's kind of it's 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 a little bit redundant of my general life. Make sense? Okay. That last phrase, I don't get it. Redundant of your general. Well, like, like it's like I'm, I'm like not getting out of my head. Like if we're going to think of space and like, literally, I'm not getting out of my head. Okay. Okay. You know, because sometimes I'm I'm focusing on my breath and just the, the sensations of breathing. Okay. Uh, and and one of one of my other goals is just to get more in my belly. I'm I'm like I can be very uptight and I'm like clenching a lot of the time as I go throughout my day. And I, all of a sudden I realize that and I just okay, you know, get like get a belly breath in and just like un let go of that muscle, those muscles. Okay. 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 So. Um, I guess one of the questions I have that I'm looking at and considering is, is like, am I watching for thoughts or am I just kind of seeing them as they come along as I'm kind of looking at this, uh, my, this, my other focus, let's say the other focus is my breath. Okay. And, um, I guess I want to kind of unpack that from a, from a, um, you know, functional perspective. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I appreciate you adding that last tagline at the end, that phrase there, because I can't teach you how to meditate like a Taoist or a Buddhist, mm-hmm. Eastern philosophical point of view, um, just reading about um, applied behavioral science, except it's commitment therapy and mindfulness approaches and how it blends into psychotherapy. Yeah. You know, and, that's, that's, and that's not that's necessarily my, my what I was, I'm trying to get at it. I'm just kind of trying to like understand these behaviors that are happening inside of me. Yeah. And f- from functional perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to do that preamble, right? Just okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Where it's coming from. Yeah. And I, and I'm going back, I think you said something like I'm too much in my head, you know, even that like right there, there's a judgment, even that, yeah. that 
that you're striving to be more mindful. Just, just, just see if that's even a workable agenda right there. Like I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to be so mindless and just even notice that, that you're setting up goals mm -hmm. for how you're going to be meditating and how you're going to be more mindful, right? And, and see if you can loosen the attachment to even that. Okay. Because that's going to be more striving. You know, I have to be less mindless and more mindful. And then you're working on that and just kind of scratch my head with, hmm, that's more mind stuff, isn't it? Mm. But then going back into do you work at noticing thoughts? I think in my opinion, you're going to get hooked by thoughts. Yeah. So it's not that, and again, I don't know if this is, different approach from Eastern philosophical approach. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if you're looking for them. When they happen, can you detach from them? Mm -hmm. I think that is more of the clinically relevant concern. It's, it's that you're fluent at thinking. This mm -hmm. private event of using language has been so well reinforced that it's got an increased likelihood of continuing to happen, right? That's yeah. what reinforcement leads to. And consequences yeah. increase the likelihood of that behavior happening again. Thinking is so well reinforced that you've got a high rate of doing that particular behavior that it, it's going to be hard for you to stop having this fluent behavior. You're going to be thinking. It's going to happen all the time. Maybe you could try to just watch out if you will be thinking, but I can guarantee you, you will be. Mm -hmm. Can you have that thought, but detach from it and detach from its influence? When you're in the middle of your cushion exercise and you start mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, what you need to get at the grocery store, you can get pretty engrossed in that. Oh, I need to get, you know, the eggs and I need to get the milk and mm -hmm. I need to get the Kool-Aid and the sugar and and then all it's, it's pretty reinforced to get that list together. But can you, on the cushion, notice it's happening now. There's verbal events and they're occurring now. They're not even occurring. I'm doing them. Thinking is a behavior. And can you actually notice it? Notice that you're having the thought and not necessarily continue with creating that grocery list and just notice it. There it is. Curiously, that's what minds do. My mind is starting to build up a grocery list. And there it is. That's what minds do. And I don't have to get caught up in the grocery list behavior now. What I am going to do is go back to my commitment of sitting on this cushion for 15 minutes and noticing my breath, my inhale and my exhale. And I'm going to make a commitment to do that. Yeah. And a commitment is action aimed in the direction of what you care about, even in the presence of obstacles. That's a definition of commitment that uh, we have in a couple of books. You're learning while you do mindfulness exercises, you're learning how to keep commitments. Again, engage in actions aimed in the direction of what you care about, even in the presence of obstacles. When you're on the cushion, you're engaging in the action of inhaling and exhaling and noticing that as a commitment. Mm -hmm. In the direction of what you care about, for some reason, you value learning more about mindfulness. I don't want to get into that right now. Mm -hmm. Even in the presence of obstacles, even if you start having grocery list thoughts, think, yeah. can you notice that as an obstacle? Because when you're thinking about your grocery list, you're no longer attending to your breath. And that's your commitment. But here's the yeah. catch. If you just keep doing that, you're engaged in a hobby of meditation. Uh -huh. What we're encouraging folks to do in the clinics where I run um, supervision, we're trying to take the idea of mindfulness exercises and then see if they can generalize. Can this committed action of attending to your inhale and your exhale on your cushion, 
even in the presence of obstacles, noticing that grocery list thinking and then noticing it as distant, being curious that that's how minds work, detaching from it and then coming back to your commitment. Can that be turned into how you parent, how you eat, how you drive, how you engage in conversation yeah. with your significant other? Can you say the same way you say for this 15 minutes during my mindfulness exercise, I'm going to make this commitment. And even if obstacles come up, I'm going to detach from it. I'm going to bring myself back to breathing. Can you say during this 15 minutes, when my significant other comes home from work, I'm going to spend 15 minutes with them and mm -hmm. I'm going to attend to them, the language that I use, what that person says to me, and I'm going to attend to or listen to that person, mm -hmm. see how I'm going to commit to responding like a worthy, significant other, you know, according to my values. And then even when you start to think, oh, this person is annoying me or, oh, this person is late for dinner. Oh, this person was supposed to pick up the milk from the dairy barn and didn't do it. Can you notice that in the same way you notice grocery list thinking while you're on the cushion, can you notice those obstacles that are going to impede you from interacting with your significant other in a values-based way? See, yeah. the mindfulness exercises that we do on our cushion, I, I think they're great. But I think they're fantastic if you actually apply that learning to other situations. You let them generalize. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because one of the notes I had uh, recently that I jotted down in my journal was just this uh, idea of uh, the relationship to everything, like just looking at my relationship to everything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's that's what I, I, I'm hearing you say is generalize that. Right. Yeah, I think yeah. so. If we're going to unpack that behavior of of staying staying true to what you're committed to do, like what's reinforcing about that? Because you're saying that the language is very reinforcing. It really it, it, it it's very reinforcing. Like how could we unpack the, the re reinforcing nature of of letting go? There's a couple of things that we can do to help people see the problems with language. Because it is so well reinforced, mm -hmm. relating, languaging, speaking, thinking, because using language is so well reinforced, it's hard to stop doing it. You can't stop yourself from doing it. I mean, this is a tried and true, but I don't mind doing it again and again. Mary had a little if you were raised as an English speaker, you just thought lamb. I thought fuck mentalism. That's what I thought. <laughs> sure you did. <laughs> <laughs> but like stimulus cues happen in our world around us. And then like, we just have thoughts and you can't yeah. control them. I think that is a good thing for folks to learn. Like you can't control your thoughts. Not all the time. Mm -hmm. And that there's something dangerous about that because the thoughts are also powerful. I mean, I could say another phrase. It's not Mary had a little and you think lamb. I could say something horrible. I could say something ridiculously offensive in 2020. I could just say some phrases right now and then my larynx will be moving and my tongue will be moving and I'll be exhaling and the sound waves because of those vibrations are just going to go through the microphone, go through the Wi-Fi, go across the world to you and it's going to record. And then someone else is going to listen to this recording like days, maybe years after I say it. And then they're going to get lit up that I just mm -hmm. went blah, 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 blah. But they mm -hmm. let it have meaning on them. They've been conditioned to let certain things that they hear light them up. Yeah. So that's like the one, two punch of language that we want to look out for. Like, yeah, language is reinforcing and there's good stuff along to it. And so your mind is your friend, but it's not always your friend. Uh -huh. Your language is helpful, but that one, two punch is you can't help what you think. Jack and Jill went up the, you can't help what you think. And then some of the things, some of the language has an influence on you. It, 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 it leads to reflexive actions. It leads us to have certain emotions. It leads to certain behavioral proclivities. 
So I like to make my clients aware of this. You are not always in control of your thoughts. And sometimes your thoughts, they are in control of you. We need mm -hmm. a new relationship. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that can help is learning to be more situationally aware. And there are some cool exercises that we could do like, and then we just talk about meditation, but we don't use those terms because yeah, mindfulness and meditation, <laughs> Ugh, that's some hippie yeah. hippie nonsense. And I don't want to do that. Okay, Roger that. It's called situational awareness now. And you're just going to have a different relationship with your private language because you need to, if you want to be psychologically flexible, yeah. if you want to go through this life, and be more values directed than hooked by like the, the society teaching and your subcultural influences. You can just say, ah, oh, I'm going to notice those thoughts that I've been made to have. Mm -hmm. And it's silly when I do the nursery rhyme, Jack and Jill went up the, and Mary had a little, but how many other things happen where someone says something and it makes you have this thought? Yeah. And that thought could be, I'm a piece of crud, mm -hmm. or this world is a dangerous place, or I can never love another person again, or that song comes on and it makes you depressed, or at least have a depressed mood, and think, I will never be happy again. Like, mm -hmm. that's what I just got done saying. It's not... It's not that much of a leap. Yeah. Jack and Jill went up a, and you think Hill. That song comes on and you go, I'll never be happy like that again. And it, 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 if I talk about lemons, sometimes people salivate. If I talk about offensive things, sometimes people get angry. If you yeah. listen to a song, sometimes you just get a depressed mood. And then you've been taught through society that depressed moods, they're negative emotions. So I got to do something to get rid of this negative emotion. It's just a natural emotion, but you gotta get rid of this negative emotion. I gotta be happy. So what I gotta do is I gotta get rid of this negative mood. Maybe I'll crunch some Vicodin and wash it down with scotch because that mellows me out. Or maybe I'll go take a nap or maybe I'll get myself involved with mindless television. Maybe I'm gonna go out for a 10 mile run to escape this feeling that I'm a piece of crud. What are you doing? The things that aren't in your control are the songs that go off when you're walking through the supermarket or the thoughts that you have because some stimulus cues showed up in your life. And then you have these thoughts and you're going to let them dictate what you do. Mm -hmm. How? Why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. And I, I think that's why I try to make it very clear to anybody who's willing to listen, you know, they sign informed consent disclaimers when they come <laughs> see me as clients. So they seem to want me to talk to them this way, making light of my own profession. But if, if, if it seems like the case conceptualization and the clinically relevant concern and the relationship sets up a context for them to be ready for it, I'll say, you know, you're not in control of your thoughts. And sometimes your thoughts are in control of you. And maybe what we need to do is build up a different relationship with this language. It can be helpful to think. It can be helpful to engage in languaging, but not all the time. So let's let's talk about that. Beautiful. I love your I love your energy. Oh, I appreciate yeah. you saying that. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and the, the the fluidity with which you uh, you shared and tied those pieces together. I think it's really helpful to hear oh. and to, to, to think about in my, but, but also, you know, one of the, the things that I've, I've been thinking about in terms of what you're talking about in terms of language, and that's, it's kind of like uh, dethroning the mind. Yeah, there you go. I like that. That yeah. works. Yeah. yeah. I like okay. that term dethroning the mind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know who said this and I can't cite chapter and verse for this stuff, but I think, there is an Eastern philosopher who talks about thinking as if it's the sixth sense, mm. like, you know, ah, uh, you know, I smell things and I touch things and I taste things and I think things and I see things and, uh, you know, I hear things like it just, it's just another thing. It's just, yeah. it's just another one yeah. of the senses and, it, and it's yeah. irreverent. Like, do, could you imagine making your whole life being predicated on what you smell? What are we dogs? You know, like, <laughs> so why do we predicate yeah. a lot of our lives on, yeah. on thinking? Yeah. Isn't there more to it? 
Yes. Yeah. Or 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 blinking, <laughs> blinking <laughs> lights telling us that, that we've got a text or a like or something. You know. Nice. Like, yes. That's right. it's such an extension right now of our mind, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, right. My, in my experience, like, oh, I got, I got to get that. I got to go. I got to follow that. Yeah. Right. I heard that. Right. Yeah. Um. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, um, there was something else there that I wanted to. I don't know what it was though, so that's not important, I guess. Um. Man, I really appreciate you and your your uh, presentation. You're just, you know, how you bring it. Oh, happy to do it, man. Yeah, this yeah. is really cool. And I know that you just started playing the saxophone. Yeah, this year. Yeah, cool. Do you have a yeah. favorite saxophonist? Uh, gosh, I, I would say I, off the top of my head, I'm going to say Pharaoh Sanders. Okay. He's. Uh, are you familiar with the story Iron John by Robert Bly? He wrote a book in the early '90s, and it it's a it's a, a Brothers Grimm fairy tale that he unpacks and looks at it from kind of a Jungian archetype perspective. Okay, I know this is act, but it, uh, act or podcast, but I'm going to talk about okay. Jung real quick. Okay. Anyways, uh, there, he he uh, uh, Pharaoh Sanders. He he, he uh, Robert Bly talks about different archetypes that like we as men have, and and he relates it to women too. One of them is the wild man, and this like desire just to be kind of just to be the wild man, hairy beasts in the woods, and. Uh, and Pharaoh Sanders is just like, I think he really embodies that. It's okay. just this, there's like this primal connection that he has. Uh, he played with uh, John Coltrane and a lot of big guys. And oh, so, okay. Yeah. That's, cool. Oh, yeah. good deal. Yeah, I was thinking about you. I was listening to um, John Coltrane um, yeah. a bit earlier. And I was thinking about the self while listening to, is, is it Bebop that, that uh, Coltrane was uh, involved yeah, in? Yeah, right. yeah. At, at one point, yeah. At the, yeah. So, I mean, just like the total expression of the self. I mean, it, it's not the self as context or the self as perspective that's playing the saxophone, but rather um, the self as process. I just uh, think that yeah. Coltrane in in Blue, Blue Train, there's, mm -hmm. there's the beginning oh, yeah. minute where everyone's playing, you know, simultaneously. Yeah. And then everyone busts into different improvisational, you know, jazz measures, you know, mm -hmm. and I just thought while I'm listening to that, while I'm thinking about the fact that we're going to talk later on today and, and we're going to talk about the self and I'm thinking about saxophone, it's like Coltrane just brought it. I think he didn't use self as content. He wasn't thinking I'm a saxophonist. He wasn't thinking I'm playing in, you know, a flat right now. He wasn't caught up in verbal stuff. I don't think yeah. he, was, he was in the selfish context where he's noticing that he is no thing. He just completely gave himself over to the process of making yeah. music. Like he, and I'm, and I, I'm, I'm a behavior analyst, uh -huh. right? I, I'm, I'm, I don't buy into dualism. He became the music. Yeah, I said it, you know, like he became <laughs> the music. He and the music were one. Like that was, that's, uh -huh. I think that's why they call it like soulful music. Like he was the music and the music yeah. was him. And like, yes, I mean, yes, it sounds yes, poetic, it. but I'll stand behind that yeah. to some degree from an act point of view, like his whole entire being while contacting that present moment was committed to the actions of playing well because he valued like aesthetics and pushing the envelope and improvisational artistry. Yeah. And then he accepted and diffused from any BS that would tell him, oh, you're taking too many chances or this yeah. is sound atonal. And he let go of the self and he just played, man. That's like... Yeah. That song, and especially in that middle part, I mean, that's pure psychological flexibility. Okay. To to, to your ears. I mean, I, it's just fantastic. Yeah. 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 The beautiful, the be the the beautiful wordless right. expression of. And there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. cool. Uh, yeah, and and actually, that brings me back to a point. What what when I had my little um, uh, brain fart before, P maybe part of the magic in mindfulness and in silence is that it's a return to our pre language state. As, as a species, 
yeah. which we, as a species, we've been on this planet for a lot longer without words and, 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 and verbs and nouns sure. than we have with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know. May, maybe. I mean, I, 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 I can, uh, I don't know if I've ever really thought about it that way that the, that mindfulness exercises bring us back to the experience of being pre-verbal. I will say very briefly and not get too involved in it, that there is the psychedelia special interest group and the association Uh of contextual behavioral sciences. And when talking to folks that have experienced psychedelia, I've learned that a lot of times it seems like you can have baby memories that are Mm. like pre-verbal, but you can still see things and shape a certain way. Um, And so that, that might be, I think there might be some kind of relationship there, but I've never thought about the idea that it's pre-verbal. I think it is peri-verbal, like I'm in the middle of it now. Okay. And I relate to it differently. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, uh, DJ, uh, I, it's been a pleasure. I really, yeah. I really appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah, and, it was uh, cool talking to you. Yeah, and you've got a, a you're working on a book with uh, Siri Ming that's going to come out here in in future sometime. Mindfulness future. action plan. Yeah, mindful yeah. action plan. Yeah. yeah, the mindful action plan. Right. Yeah, and and you know when it does, I'll I'll, I'll link it for sure. You know, hey, we'll, right on. That would be awesome. I'd appreciate notes. that. And um, and you do executive coaching and uh, all kinds of consulting through Pixlide. Right consulting yeah Yeah. okay a lot of fun good stuff marcel thank you thank you for my for for having me thanks a lot marcel take care but i'm getting stronger they take a piece of me but i'm getting stronger they take a piece of me, but I'm getting stronger. They take a piece of me, but I'm getting stronger.